Welcome to Shaping the NYC Skyline, the podcast that explores the stories behind the buildings that shape our city. I'm your host, David Chamchovich, and I'm here with my co-host, Brenda Slokowski. We interviewed David Marks from Silverstein Properties. I love his approach to the real estate development industry as a whole. I fully agree. And I always say this. I always agree with you, Brenda, yeah. except when I don't. But this particular time I do it, his attitude towards deal making, towards relationship building, and how he talks about being a mensch. And yeah. he really is a mensch. And I think that's the key to his success. He explained how he goes about negotiating a deal, getting people to agree seems to all center around him being a good guy. Yeah. And you really do catch more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. Yeah. I really, everything about his approach, his his attitude, and the way he communicates with people and goes about business is really respectable. And I really hope our listeners take his methodology and moves forward because everybody needs a little more nice in the world. You know, that's a very good message. And I hope that people follow suit. And I'm so excited to present this interview. And I'm hoping that future guests will have the same impact on us. It really has changed the way that I've thought about, you know, the property development and how to go about growing your career. I, I learned a ton from him. Yeah. And I think our audience is going to also. I know. I can't wait for everybody to give us feedback. Yeah. The feedback would be great. Comments would be great. Subscribing yeah. would be great. And or even just listening. If you, yeah. don't, if you don't like engaging, give us some more listens. Sorry for the crack, guys. I have a little bit of a cold. Give us some more listens. I know. <laughs> Listen, I, I had to take a sick day two weeks ago. <laughs> you should Good take job. David Mark's advice and be a mensch to yourself. Oh, yeah. I love that. <laughs> guys, follow us on Instagram. We're, we have some great reels out to promote our podcast, and you'll get some inside scoops, maybe some behind the scenes of when we record our episodes, and you'll get notifications of when we publish a new episodes. It'll be great. Yeah. Give us a follow. And without further ado, David marks the spot. Hello, hello. Welcome, David. Thank you. Thanks for having me. We had a chance to, to chat a little bit, and I think you have a very interesting background. Maybe you want to just tell people your background, where you were born, and, and how have you got to the United States? Yeah. Sure. So my background will also explain my funky accent. <laughs> I was born in London. My father's English, my mother's Israeli. So I grew up bilingual speaking English with my dad and Hebrew with my mom. And it was always, a, you know, an interesting childhood. When we were, when I was very young, we moved to Israel. I wasn't even three years old. So spent all of my life in Israel, went to the, you know, went to school, served in the army, did my, uh, my grad in, uh, in business. And right after school, I was very fortunate to land a job with Migdal Insurance Company. At the time, so this was 2009, the Israeli institutions found that you know they wanted to continue to gain exposure into real estate overseas. But post-2008, they were all sitting there looking at all the PE funds they invested in and all the external managers that traditionally gave them that exposure for overseas real estate. They lost most, if not all, of their equity in those funds, yet all those managers were driving their Porsches to their houses in the Hamptons. <laughs> so all these Israeli institutional managers sat there and said, well, next time we're going to do this direct. And let's hire the people in house and let's go buy real estate direct and not through these, you know, funds or managed accounts. <laughs> so, is that what you focused on in school, which is uh, property acquisitions? So, in school, I did sort of general business management uh, focused in finance. But during my summer breaks, when all my friends went to Thailand, I thought that it would be probably more practical if I tried to find an internship somewhere that will give me a leg up after school. And I was fortunate to land an internship at a private equity real estate fund in London, where I spent about seven weeks. And that was sort of my first experience into real estate investments. And I just wanted to test whether it actually interests me or not. I had some background from home. My dad's been doing it you know, for 40 plus years. And I said, why don't you go have the experience? I love London. And most of my family's in London. It was super challenging, but at the same time, it was an amazing experience. I built, you know, relationships and a network, and it was sort of just the foundations to to my career at the time without even realizing it. And then again, during the other summer in school, same thing, saw opportunities to get more involved to understand the business instead of going to Thailand again or somewhere else. So when I graduated, I had a 
bit more experienced than my peers, than my fellow graduates. I was a bit more focused on what I think my relative advantage is in, in the market. And I thought it was the fact that I had, you know, English as a language and I had some experience in my resume and I wanted to leverage that. And tying back to where the institutions were at the time in terms of mindset, they hired in-house real estate investments professionals to do both low domestic investments in Israel, but then starting to look at direct investments to overseas. And this is 2009. There was a short window of opportunities and a lot of them started jumping buying real estate in the UK and in Germany and in the US. And Migdal Insurance had a head of real estate who was a great individual. They had the largest real estate portfolio in Israel. At the time, it was 5 billion shekels. It was more than double the, yeah. the, the next competitor. So they, they knew they liked real estate, got it. They, they had asset managers in-house and the whole shebang, but they didn't have that international bridge they needed. And the head of real estate was really focused all day on like sort of putting fires out. He didn't have that strategic mindset. He wasn't very international, both culturally and from a language perspective. So he didn't feel comfortable jumping on a plane to New York or to London, building networks and relationships and trying to source deals. But he was looking for someone young, energetic, humble, that he can sort of you know mold into how he wanted things to be done, but had that edge with the language, with the culture, a bit of network, just the basics to sort of help pouring into that space. You must have been something like 22, 24 when you, when I was you started? I was 26. So remember, we have three plus years of military service. So I served for just over three years, and then I took a, a, a year break from life. I went traveling. My well deserved. Yeah. So most, most individuals who you know, finish their service in Israel go for some period of travel just to clean your head and yeah. you know, do just what you want to do. I picked South and Central America. So I spent about a year traveling Very South, cool. Central wow. America. I actually finished my trip in Alaska, and then I was planned to come to New York for a week. I stayed here for a month, fell in love with the city. And I think it's then, it was 2005, that I told myself, one day, you got to live here. You have to do something here. Didn't know what, didn't know how, didn't know when, but I fell in love with the city, fell in love with the energy, and, and I just knew that one day I want to move here and do something. Yeah. Just going back a little bit, you said your dad was in real estate. Is he in the States or is he still in Israel? He's in Israel, but his center of business was always the UK. When he was 18, he started his own brokerage shop in Mayfair in London, Teacher Marks. I think it actually still exists, but he's not involved in that anymore. And then back in the 90s, after we moved to Israel and he tried some other areas of business, he went back to real estate and basically became a broker slash facilitator for investors who wanted to invest in the UK. So large Israeli companies, institutions, and he'd find the deals. He was a director at Jones Lang Wooten at the time, now Jones Lang LaSalle. So he had basically, he could offer all of his partners slash investors sort of a host of services that they weren't aware of and they didn't have access to through Israel, through his services as sort of a conduit to JLL through London investing in London and other parts of the UK as well as other parts of Europe. And he built his own sort of club of investors that had a lot of trust in him to source the deal, source the financing, put it all together, complete the due diligence. And thereafter, he stayed on the deal, typically sort of the, the general partner slash asset manager overseeing everything for them in conjunction with the JLL services. Wow. He built his reputation around being a very honest, charming person, but also having a very wide suite of services that he could provide based on the investor or the group's needs. Someone just wanted, you know, I just want you to find the asset and I can do everything else. Or someone says, look, I just have the capital and really need someone to partner with who I can trust to do A to Z, source the deal, source the financing, bring all the attorneys, you know, all the closing team that's, that's needed and stay on later to help us asset manage and oversee, help, you know, value out and whatnot. So growing up, I was really, you know, curious about my dad's business. I remember going to work with him during summers in high school and trying to understand exactly what it is that he's doing and sort of interning with him over those summers. I was actually going to ask you that, that whether he had like a take your son to, to work day, but it sounds like you had some shadowing experience that really was, was helpful to guiding you, right? Yeah, it was shadowing experience. And also, you know, I'd spend time, you know, at the time you only had car phones. You didn't have cell phones. And he often had, I'd sit in the car with him going, you know, wherever his phone would ring and I would listen for 10, 20, 30 minutes during car rides to his conversations. And it always seemed so interesting. <laughs> he always seemed so important. Like, wow, he's talking about million of pounds here and million pounds there and this guy and that guy. 
And, you know, it just got me thinking, and what exactly was that about? What exactly was that about? And then Friday night dinners, we had a tradition at home for years. If, you know, we'd eat at, I don't know, 7.30, we'd all meet. I have two brothers. We'd meet half an hour to an hour before. Typically, my dad would bring out a bottle of whiskey each time, something different. And we'd have sort of happy hour, and it would be our time to just reconnect. What, how was your week? What did you do? And he would always share with us stories from work. You know, we're working on this deal. We have this disappointment. We had this success. This guy's trying to screw me. <laughs> this guy's a real mensch. And it sort of drew me. I was really drawn by just business making, problem solving, also obviously, you know, making money if you can along the way, and just dealing with people. And I always felt that that's what he was doing. He was dealing with people. And at the same time as he was providing for the family, he was also building this really cool business. And that's sort of, I think, where, as, as Brian said on his podcast, that was bit by the bug. Did yeah. your brothers have the same sort of experience or did they air um, one, my oldest is an architect, but he started as an architect in sort of the most artistic way possible. I think in you know recent years developed, he has his own studio in London, Matha Architects. And now he's, yes, he's a very artistic architect, but at the same time, he's very business oriented as well. Definitely thinks a bit more commercial. And my other brother is an actor, screenplay writer. So, so totally the opposite direction. Totally the opposite direction. Sort of an architect too. Yeah, for sure. Designs a story. He's a developer of stories. Exactly. Yeah. He's, a, he's a story developer. You loved New York after you're traveling, but what made you take the plunge and move yeah. to New York and start here? So I started working for Migdal in 2009, and I was brought on to form the overseas real estate investments portfolio. I did that for four years, and during those four years, we did 14 deals. Eight of them were in the US, and six of them were in Europe, mostly in Germany. And the whole team that was doing Israel, and I was just brought on to develop the whole international portfolio. And it was pretty cool. I was young. I was in my late 20s. I was single. I had in my apartment in Tel Aviv, and a week a month, I was traveling. I was in Germany, in London, New York. Yeah. yeah. It was a really interesting period, but I worked really hard. And the cool part about it was as an LP, as a limited partner investor, I had to joint venture with local operators, local sponsors, whether if it was developers or owner operators, managers, asset managers, property managers. And I got to build a great relationship and to meet a ton of people. And towards the end of those four years, came to New York like most of my trips. Actually, the first deal we did in the US was 1412 Broadway. We, we bought that in December of 2010. So it was a really interesting time to buy real estate in, uh, in New York. And almost every trip I had to the US started or ended in New York. And I'd sort of engineer it that way. Even if I didn't have to be in New York, just as a connection flight on the way back, you know, I finished working on a Friday in Chicago. I'm not flying home. I'm single. I like, had a few friends in New York. Let's connect through New York Friday, Saturday, Sunday, take the red eye straight into the office on Monday. So I had these weekends in New York. And every time I came here, it was, again, another great experience. And started to have these relationships and contacts through business, you know, brokers and other investors, attorneys, accountants, people who supported our business expansion into the US. And every time I came here, that dream of, you know, settling down here in one way or another grew and stuck to me. And then on the fourth year at Migdal, I did two deals with Silverstein as an LP. Tal, who's Larry's son-in-law, came to Israel in early 2012. And his objective was to expand Silverstein's capital network with Israeli institutions because we were all so actively investing in the US and they were looking to recap 120 Wall Street. That was step one in my relationship with Silverstein. Tal came to Israel. We had a coffee. I think it was like 8.30 a.m. in Ramad Gan. And I was the first institution he met. And he said, we want to recap 120 Wall Street. And he shows me the book. And I look at it. And immediately, I was interested. And I told him, this is interesting. Anyways, cut a long story short, we stepped up for the deal. And together with Menorah, who's another large institution in Israel, the largest pension plan in Israel, we recapped 120 Wall Street with Silverstein. So wow. due to regulations in Israel, we're not, we weren't allowed to invest more than 49% into these international JVs. So if a sponsor said, hey, I'm taking you know, 20%, we couldn't take 80, we would then go and syndicate and split that position. And the best or the most efficient and productive way for us was to reach out to one of our Israeli competitors and do it together. So what made it so appealing that you wanted to partner and so move forward with the deal? 120 Wall Street at the time, again, this is, we're talking about 2012, New York was still in the recovery. Right. We felt that trades were still being made at fairly low basis. We felt that the city was poised for rent growth. We felt that the financial district was undervalued in many senses. And the basis at which Silverstein were offering the recap seemed very attractive to us. It was value add. 
The building was over 20% vacant and we felt that we we're aligning ourselves with one of the best operators in the city. Larry's owned the building since the late 70s or early 80s. So this was his second or third recap. Uh, he obviously believed in the asset. The asset has a special feature. And during that process, I got to know the organization very well, specifically the executives, Marty Berger, Tal Carrot, had a few encounters with Larry, which I'll never forget. And they got to know me. And we closed the deal. And five weeks later, we closed the deal, Rosh Hashanah 2012. It was September 10th, I believe, 2012. And what, six weeks later, Superstorm Standing. So you're sitting in Israel, you're watching the news, and you see the storm just wiping out Lower Manhattan. Yeah. I'm just thinking about, okay, it's a matter of minutes till my CIO calls me. He was like, great timing, huh, Mike? <laughs> and you, you couldn't have predicted the hurricane? Well, not six weeks. <laughs> Typically, I can do it in two, three weeks. Right. But it's too not far six out. weeks. Yeah, I was too far out. And I'm just sitting there shaking. I'm like, oh, my God, this building's really getting knackered. This is like right on the water. And we get on a call 24 hours later with Tal and the asset manager, and they give us a rundown of what happened. and you know, how they manage it. And I'm like, wow, this sounds like a military operation. So we waited for, I think it was a, a week or 10 days and my CIO and I jump on a plane and we come to, we come to New York to visit the property. Lower Manhattan, especially around Wall Street and the water area, looked like a real shit show. Yeah. Right, decimated. It, it, was, it, was war, it was war zone, right? Streets were closed off. You saw property managers and facility managers for all sort of the, you know, the third party intermediaries running in the street because he had the same facility or property manager working in three or four buildings within a few blocks. He hadn't right. slept in like three <laughs> weeks. Most buildings were down. They weren't operational yet. They couldn't find gas to run the generators. They were trying to get the buildings in some shape or form, but they were weeks if not months away from reopening. And he, we were two weeks after the storm, we walked in the building and tenants are walking into the building. Like the building's up and running. Some floors were still damaged. The newsstand, which was completely flooded, was converted into a war room. So we walk in, you see just desks with people wearing 120 Wall Street merchandise, polo shirts and caps. And they're all with, you know, radios and they have full working desks, computers, laptop printers. I'm like, when did all this happen? <laughs> like the storm was two weeks ago. How, when did you get this whole thing up and running? And then they told me all these stories about how they, you know, once they knew the storm was coming, our head of operations had basically procured two gas tanks or trailer tanks and brought them in from Pennsylvania and the other one from Florida. And they drove for three days and we got the special permit to get them across the bridge by the type of operator Silverstein were, right? They, they definitely had the resources, they had the skills, they had the foresight. They weren't shy to deploy them regardless to whether this is going to be a loser or a winner. It was about reputation, about doing the right thing for the tenants and for their stakeholders, their investors and their lender. And that was the real accelerator to our relationship. Because I always used to tell sponsors we JV'd with is, you know, I like to take it slow. We're going on one date. We're going to do one deal. We're going to look at one or two quarters of reporting and distributions and communication just to see that we're all on the same page before we you know, take it to the next step. Right. You have to build trust first. Exactly. Yeah. And then, you know, two, three quarters in, you can show me more deals and we can, you know, potentially solidify this and move in together and do another deal or maybe do something programmatic. But Sandy experience really accelerated the relationship. We felt very comfortable with Silverstein. And a few weeks later, they called us up with a new, with another deal. And they said, look, th this is a really interesting conversion opportunity, the Beekman Tower Hotel on 49th and 1st. To convert that to corporate housing. We had 209 units on the far west side at you know, Silver Towers where we were operating those as corporate housing and we wanted to expand that business. So after those two deals, relationship grew with, with the Silverstein. And at the same time, I made a career decision. I felt that I wanted to move from the LP side to the GP. I always wanted to be more on the creation side, closer to the asset and not just the LP making the, the, the financial investment. I felt like I really wanted to both learn and be a part of the value creation. I was always attracted to development since I was young. And I felt that if I could somehow find my way either to London or New York and do complicated mixed use development, that's my sort of path to becoming a five point player. I wanted to know how to do, you know, design, construction, development, leasing, finance, acquisition, disposition, the full gamut, retail, office, resi, all sort of the, 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 the major food groups. And Silverstein was obviously that shop that could offer me that type of experience. So I was thinking of going back to London to work for the same fund that I interned with. And then we had our closing dinner in New York for, for Beekman. And I was sharing a, a potential opportunity I had with Tal and Larry. And I said, you know, I'm thinking of relocating, leaving everything behind, my family, my friends, 
moving to New York, I have this potential offer on the table to join a friend who just started a small fund and just thinking, you know, just, you know, picking your brain. What do you think about the market, the opportunities? Do you think this is a good offer? Do you think that for someone my age and, you know, you've worked with me now for over a year, what are your thoughts? And Larry Tal looked at me and said, well, if you're really thinking of leaving everything behind, moving to New York, you obviously had a great experience with the team and I was being very complimentary of everything, you know, of the team and, and the individuals and the organization. They said, you know, we have a robust pipeline. Why don't you come and join us? And I said, Let's do it. <laughs> Show me the signature block. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's probably the highest form of honor you can get, right? Working yes. with somebody who's kind of on the other side or a partner and then them wanting to bring you over. Do you have any understanding what it is you think they, they saw in you or what qualities or characteristics they saw that they really, that they really like? I guess I'm asking you to compliment yourself a yeah. little bit, but it's not too hard, right? Uh, it is. I actually don't like complimenting myself. My, <laughs> my wife would attest to that. I think when I, do deals when I negotiate deals with partners. I'm very much, and I can say this after working for Larry for 10 years, that even then I was, I'm very menchy. I'm not the kind of deal guys that does things for spite. I'm not the tit for tat. I'm not the, I'm going to stick you. I'm not the, I'm going to stick to the four corners of the contract. If I'm not being, you know, if it doesn't change my position in the deal, if there's no adverse effect to my position, if I'm not compromising my investment, if I'm not taking higher risk, then I'm happy to do something. Right. Yeah. And I think it's that mentee approach. I'm very transparent. I'm very cut to just say to the chase. I'm Israeli, so I'm tachlis. I don't <laughs> eat around the bush and I don't do a lot of small talk. But at the same time, I'm very transparent. I'm very open about how I see things and how I look at things. Personal, open, transparent, mentee way, less adversary, not avoiding confrontation, but I just think and I believe there are better ways to do business. I mean, I think side, that's a great quality. Side, side and Shine were at the table with me negotiating yeah. deals for the last mm -hmm. few years, whether if it's with, a city agency or a partner or a lender. And I think it's, you know, that type of interaction that people, especially, you know, people who can pick the people they want to work with would prefer any day rather yeah. than, you know, the more adversary, confrontational type people. It's definitely something that I noticed about you. And I would really pay attention to how you presented yourself because certain circumstances that made things very uneasy. And I think that's, I think that's a superpower that you have Sometimes people who negotiate deals as a living, mm -hmm. it's almost like sport. They, they sometimes can't really distinguish between, you know, what's important and what isn't important. Sometimes you'll just negotiate a point just because you feel like you have to. And if a partner or a lender said, look, I need this, or can I have this, or can we make this adjustment? Instead of instinctively thinking to yourself, what can I extract from this? Thinking about, okay, yeah doesn't change anything for me. So why not? One of the things I learned from Larry and you know, as an organization is in the long term, you will yield much more if you take the Menchi approach about things, especially when things go bad. Because people remember that, right? When things are great, everyone's great. Everyone's happy. It's much easier. But when things go bad and in, in challenging environments like we're experiencing now, if you still decide to do the Menchi thing and, you know, think before you just take that you know, tougher position or the tit for tat or try to extract a pound of flesh just because you can. Because the other side knows that you could, but you decided not to. It's something, there's something chromatic about doing business that way. And I think, you know, that's been guiding me um, throughout my career. And I, I feel like in most cases, not all of them, but in most cases, it did yield more than the other approach of being, you know, taking a hard line and you know, trying to get the most out yeah. of everything just because negotiations can be sporty. I think that's really respectable, actually. How do you think you came to that conclusion? Israelis can be very tough business people, and they can be very difficult, and they can be, you know, very for spite. And at the same time, growing up with an English gentleman as my father, who never really adopted that way. He was always very true to himself and to his principles and to his values. And I remember him, you know, doing business and he's saying, I don't get it. Why do people think they have to be difficult in order to be respected? Why do people have to be adversary or confrontational just to feel like they won the deal? If it was for another hundred thousand shekels or dollars, does it really like, they're more important things and your reputation is your most valuable asset. And that's something that you're going to build throughout your career. And just think about how do you want people to perceive you in the business place? and is it more important to be perceived as, you know, 
tough and tough but reasonable and menschy and someone who people want to work with? Or do you want to be that tough guy that people say, yeah, I want him on my side, but if I can't have him on my side, I'd rather not deal with him. So I think it's that combination of growing up with those two type of personas around you that helped me, you know, I think I found myself somewhat more like my dad, but at the same time, I learned lessons through his lenses and through his experiences that helped me gain a bit of both. Well, let me tell you. I got shivers through my spine. It's like a Ted Lasso episode. Ted Lasso is all about <laughs> sons and fathers. And sounds like your dad was a mensch, really. That's what you learned from him. Yes. So 2012, right? You're sitting down at this dinner. They give you this offer. What position was it? From my perspective, I was taking it with a lot of humility. For me to join a group like Silverstein Properties was a dream come true. And I really wanted to understand and learn development. And I didn't have any background in development. So I was assigned to be an assistant development manager. And for me, that was taking a step back and starting over because, you know, at Migdal, I was, I started and then I made my way up. But it was funny because, you know, I'd come to New York and I'm thinking about August of 2013. I had already tied my deal up with Silverstein. I was waiting for my immigration status to to clear up. And I came um, sort of a transition trip with um, my successor to New York to introduce him. And I was introducing him to all the brokers, right? So we were going to JLL and East Hill and Newmark and all these different groups. And at the time, because you know, I was representing Migdal, I had access to all the biggest tonchos without mentioning specific names. Like every time I was in New York, I'd text or email them and they'd take me out for a drink or for dinner and they'd introduce me to the biggest sponsors and they'd introduce me to all the big players in the market. But then when I, you know, I arrived in New York in October of 2013 and my, you know, my email signature said assistant development manager. And I sent out emails to all these buddies of mine saying, you know, I moved to New York, would be great to grab a drink. And they're like, yeah, we actually just had dinner with Marty the other day. We'll catch up soon. I, I got the message. Now right. I'm just an assistant development manager. You've been replaced. Yeah. But now 10 years later, we're all buds again. <laughs> um, well, you've so, got a different title now. So. Yeah. So at the time, you know, I, I, I realized that I have a lot to learn and I had great people to learn from. I was assigned to uh, an awesome development manager who was sort of my direct boss. His name is John Garnier. Uh, shout out. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's with GID now, but I worked with him on both Beekman Tower and One West End, which um, I spent about five, six years working on together with Side and Shine yeah, and many yeah. aspects of that deal. But I started off as an assistant development manager, which was like 70, 75% of my time. And then the other 20, 25% was dealing with, you know, Israeli capital markets relationships, dealing with, you know, the Migdals, the Menorahs and other groups that we were building relationships with as potential capital partners and part, part time with the acquisition team trying to source new deals. But the focus was really just learn mixed use development and you know learn the organization inside out and how a mixed use developer owner operator operates and you know i was on the development team for six years i started as an assistant development manager and i grew to be a development manager and during that time you know we mostly focused on one west end but then starting to source new development opportunities and at the time we were four vps that were all doing acquisition and development we didn't have very clear lanes or jurisdiction which was, you know, a good thing and a bad thing. But what it gave us beyond the autonomous experience encouraged us to gravitate to the areas where we actually had the passion. Right. So one of us was more about buying skyscrapers and building our portfolio nationally. And another one was focused on new businesses and he was pushing to start the debt business. And I at the time, and maybe because I was, you know, I fell in love with Manhattan, but then I actually discovered the outer boroughs in Brooklyn in 2015, 16, 17, and it was turning to be this really cool place. And I just loved waking up in the weekend and getting on the subway and picking a neighborhood and just going and exploring it on a Saturday or a Sunday. So came about different areas in Brooklyn and different areas in Queens and Jersey City. And I sort of became the acquisitions development guy that's sourcing now potential new development mostly focused on residential. So we were looking in Brooklyn and we were looking in West Queens and we were looking in Jersey City and that's how some of our current deals came about. So we you know we put together some really exciting projects like Innovation Queens, which Sidon and China yeah. were involved with that as well. We pursued another uh, project which is currently under construction on Northern Boulevard and 45th Street, which is a block and a half away from Innovation Queens, currently under construction. We have a project in General Square in Jersey City that came about through that kind of strategy, but it was really 
you know, Manhattan felt like it was becoming very expensive and there was this flight for affordability, which drove this growth in all these different pockets and yeah. the outer boroughs were growing. And at a certain point, I remember reading a New York Times article about how New York lost its cool factor. And I really, re it really resonated with me because, you know, I was in my early thirties and I felt like there was so much more for areas like, you know, parts of Brooklyn and Astoria and even pockets in Jersey City that had more to offer, more affordable. It was more, it was less intimidating. It was more family friendly. And some of my friends were already starting to have babies. And I totally saw how those areas are poised to grow. And from, be from being the cheaper alternative, it became the just more desirable alternative, not just because of affordability. So that what drove that strategy. So we, we tied up a few projects. And then in late 2020, I was offered to head acquisitions for the group. And at the same time, we sort of broke out the, what was then the deal team into four different verticals, just so we're a bit more siloed because we grew from like seven to 24 in a year. And you know, we, grew, we grew the businesses and we grew our capital sources. And we're now, that's how we operate. We have our you know, debt platform, Silverstein Capital Partners, which is led by Michael May. We have our Opportunity Zone Fund, which is the Cantor Silverstein OZ Fund, which is a joint venture with Cantor Fitzgerald. Where we're in our second fund now. First fund was about 600 million. Now we're already over 200 million have raised for our second fund. And that's investing you know, around the country in different developments and opportunity zones. We have our development vertical. Uh, that focuses mostly on execution, but also you know sources new projects. Whether if it's you know development advisory services like building uh, the Disney headquarters um, in Hudson, and then you know other projects we're involved with, and then I had, had the acquisition team, which is basically responsible for all family balance sheet equity investments. Whether if it's acquiring development sites to develop on our balance sheet, develop or acquiring development sites to develop in joint venture with our OZ fund. Uh, acquiring, you know, income producing multifamily or office um, buildings, as well as our new initiative, which is office to residential conversions. So the acquisitions that you work on are throughout the country? Yes. Yeah. So um, one example is you know, last year, we made a strategic decision to grow our development business and overlay it with our opportunity zone strategy. So we, we started looking into Florida and we felt that you know, southeast around Miami and Fort Lauderdale was getting a bit saturated, but we really liked what was going on in central West Florida. Uh -huh. And, you know, Tampa, we're, we're a very data-driven investor. And as we were putting together that investment strategy, we felt that Tampa was a great market to focus on. Just a lot of in-migration, job growth, you know, strong population, great demographics, and just the supply-demand dynamics in that market were very compelling. So we identified a site in downtown Tampa, which is coincidentally also an opportunity zone. We could overlay different strategies into this great site where we're now planning to build um, about 450 units in downtown Tampa. Wow. Do you find that the development environment in, in Florida or other states is, let's go with, less tense than it is in New York? Um, more developer friendly? <laughs> more developer friendly. Yes. I was, going, I was going to say it's definitely more development friendly. A lot of things about it are much more at ease, less, you know, Ten. tense. Yes. Yeah. I think, you know, obviously you guys spoke about it here in your podcast and everyone's talking about the politics and how in recent years, politics have been super challenging for developers, Real, you know, taxes, incentives, those kind of things. Like you can buy an entitled site in Florida um, and have a very clear path and a very business-friendly administration, a very business-friendly and development-friendly community. And people will look at you like, hey, you're the developer. You're going to invest in our community. You're going to take risk on our community, and you're going to do something good. You're going to bring businesses. You're going to bring, you know, grow the economy. They understand you're taking a risk, and they're willing to reward you for that. Versus a lot of the, you know, nimbyism we've been seeing here in the last decade, where developers are villains. So I definitely understand why developers uh, are looking elsewhere, but at the same time, I have to say that, you know, Larry, the family, leadership, myself, we're all very big believers in New York. And you've heard Larry say this before, you know, I've, I've, I've read the obituary in New York before, and I'll probably read it again, but never bent, bet against New York. And I think our convert to core thesis, which is really sort of predominantly focused on the New York metro, is another testament to how you know, we're willing to invest resources and dollars 
into the New York Metro because we really believe in it. It's the center of the region and it will continue to grow and it will continue to attract talent and it will continue to attract students and it will continue to attract businesses. And that's, you know, those are the main, I think, drivers to build the city. As totally. as- You're right. You don't bet against New York. It always, it always comes back. But at the same time, it's good while things are not great in New York to go someplace else. And I think that sends a clear message that if New York is not going to be friendly to developers, then we'll just build elsewhere. Right. Yeah. You know, I've, I've spent a lot of time with the Rebney team. We're doing a great job and trying to, to really understand how the legislator and how the folks in Albany think, operate, legislate. We're all very confused. Yeah. <laughs> v- v- very confusing, right? Yeah. I think when we, we, bought a, we bought a residential building in December of 21 in Lower Manhattan. And that stemmed from sort of a shift in our thesis or in our theme to focus more on residential. And right after we closed on that deal, that was an office to residential conversion that was converted 10 years before we bought it. So we started diving into that and we were like, okay, let's let's look at the dynamics. We're oversupplied on class B, C office. We're uh, undersupplied on residential. We assumed or we took the bet that the 421A will expire without a replacement program. And we couldn't tell at the time, right? This is like January, February of 22, how long it would take to replace. But the political climate pointed at a certain gap. And we were looking at the data and it's just like, you know, the supply, the, the, the inventory, the supply is so dry and the demand is going to come back, right? So this is summer fall 21 into winter 22, the city's really recovering. Every, you know, 65% of the population already got their second jab. People are coming back to the office. We're like a 25, 30% utilization at the time. But at the same time, like you couldn't find a table at a restaurant. Right. You, you, you got to a bar after 10 o'clock, they're like turning you around. People are obviously back in the city regardless of whether they're working in the office. So we felt that, you know, New York is coming back and you're looking at the numbers and there's just not enough to pop. And we're starting having con- conversations with Rebney and we're starting to put together our thesis around convert to core as we concluded that this is probably the most interesting time in the history of the city, definitely in the last 30 years, to convert these underutilized, underoccupied class B and C office buildings to residential. Because if you really do want to gain scale and not only scale, but free market scale in New York City, the only way you can do it today is if you can find those buildings that can be converted to residential. And the reason was, again, you don't have the incentives. Without the incentives, it just doesn't pencil. And even if you had all the money in the world, if I told you, go and assemble land now that each lot will generate five to 600 apartments, it would probably take you seven to 10 years just to assemble that lot to generate that amount of FAR. And every 400, 500,000 square feet of office building, right? outside your window can generate close to 600 free market apartments at probably half the time if you can detenant the building. So that's sort of what stemmed Convert to Core. But that also, like I said, gave birth to looking at this whole thesis and strategy of converting office to residential. Yeah. So hopefully in two weeks, we'll be closing on our first um, office to residential acquisition in the financial district, 55 Broad Street, in partnership with Metroloft with Nathan Berman. And that will hopefully seed a much bigger platform of converting 10 to 15 office buildings over the next decade to residential. You know, we obviously think that the current dynamics are, are, you know, very well positioned for that strategy. When we put the thesis together 18 months ago, it was mostly about, you know, office values will decline because of occupancy. Jerome Powell helped us, gave us a push on values as well with, you know, interest rate policy, but at the same time, significantly increased cost of capital took away liquidity, so complicated the, the, the transactional side of things. But the fundamental for the thesis, just from a, an office and residential perspective, you know, inventory is tighter than ever, demand, rent growth on the residential side and office, unfortunately, continues to suffer. Yeah. You guys are doing it as of right. Do you think other developers are doing it as of right as well? Do you think the tax incentive would incentivize Silverstein to do more? So we, we are doing it as of right, and it will be 100% free market, no subsidies, no incentives, no abatements. I definitely think there is a need for a tax abatement incentive and definitely over the past year, right? So it's all about the math and if you can make it pencil. So the conversions do typically come in at a 15 to 20% lower basis than ground up, but at the same time, you are, you are going to pay much higher taxes. So it can work 
at a certain basis, assuming your rents are at a certain level so that the map, map can actually work. If you provide a tax abatement, that will expand the opportunity set exponentially, meaning you won't have to buy the building at this basis. You can afford to buy it at a much higher basis because the math will work. If you do that, you solve for much more buildings that can actually be you know, traded in the marketplace. At the moment, there's a huge bid-ask spread between converters and sellers, mm -hmm. which is tightening over the last you know, 12 to 18 months, just given the environment and given the reality and maturities and what we're seeing. But we have spent many hours with Rebney looking into the different ideas they had on the table. And unfortunately, the politics continue to prevail, meaning the politicians are focused more on affordable housing than housing. And in my view, you have to first solve the housing crisis before you solve the affordable housing crisis. And trying to load all these affordable housing requirements is something I understand the politicians have to introduce as part of the deal, as part of the trade with developers. But at the same time, they're not really looking at the numbers. They're not looking at financial viability. And I think that Revenue are doing a great job trying to educate the decision makers and the legislators. But part of the equation, a part of the conversation that just ignores the four-letter word that continues to drive this industry, which is math. The numbers just don't work. And you know they were looking at different levels of AMI and different levels of affordability. And you know what they were proposing was dilutive to different projects. So we put together models based on live deals that we were looking at based on 55 Broad and others. And we showed them, you know, and showed them if I was a developer and this is what you were offering me, I would pick to just go as of right because it's dilutive. This is where you need to be for us to be neutral. And this is where you need to be for this to be accrued. That's the direction that conversation took. But then the response from the electeds were, we actually think the affordability needs to be higher and deeper, right? So lower AMI, <laughs> and instead of 15%, it should be 25%. And so we just it went in that direction. And obviously, everyone knows how conversations in Albany went. And unfortunately, you know, the city definitely needs it. You know, one of the things we were talking about when we, when we signed up 55 Board and we were working with lenders and, and equity partners was we're looking at it from, a, from an investor developer perspective, but there's so much more to it from a, a responsible adaptive reuse strategy. For people talking ESG, let's not talk in you know slogans. First of all, from the government's perspective, the city perspective, the residents, the services. Empty or half empty office buildings create certain local decay, right? Because you've got the retailers that live off footfall and daytime population and traffic. Take away all that traffic and those people stay at home to work on Zoom and Teams. What happens to that, you know, what happens to the, to the retailer, the dry cleaner, the newsstand, the taco place, the restaurant, the cafe, less footfall, they close retail. Close retail means dark storefronts. Dark storefronts attract no good and the local economy will be impacted. Second is, as you guys know better than anyone else, real estate taxes. How are these office buildings and the occupancy is going to impact real estate taxes to the city? People are now waking up. The hall is now standing up, realizing you're going to have the serious deficit. So we showed them how a building like 55 Broad in less than 10 years from the 2021 real estate tax bill will double to 2029, right? So that's another aspect to it. It's about real estate taxes that will provide for services and keep the city going. The other thing was crime and keeping the city vibrant and local economies and the moms and pop. And then the last, but definitely not least, is the environmental impact. Some of these buildings will have to be knocked down and rebuilt. And from a carbon footprint perspective, you know, adaptive reuse, if you can take that building, not knock it down, turn it from, you know, a 1960s office building that consumes a lot of energy for, you know, what we're seeing today is probably 300 people a day on average. And you replace that with a LEED certified, full electric, carbon neutral, zero emission residential building that houses over a thousand people with good income that will actually help reactivate the local economy, consume about 30% of the energy that building used to consume, no gas, right? Full electric, eliminating 95% of building services and systems. You've just taken a building that was quote unquote done and was ready to be replaced and you reused it, you, you repurposed it and you did good for the city, you did good for the local community, you provided housing, and probably the one of the worst housing crises the city's ever seen, and you significantly reduced the footprint, 
and the energy consumption that specific building consumed before. And I can go on and on, yeah. right? But it, it felt like the strategy was checking so many boxes from a responsible developer operator's perspective that I think that's what the city and Albany need to focus on. Yes, affordable housing is definitely a must. Yes, it should definitely be included in the program. We've built affordable housing in the city and we continue to build affordable housing in the city. And we would love to integrate it into our conversions, but the numbers have to work. Otherwise, it's not financially viable. The points you make are very valid. It's not just about building. It's not just about the bottom line for the developer, but it's about the repercussions that building has, right? If you build, they will come. And people will flock there. And if there's no building, then storefronts are closing, not generating taxes, not supporting local businesses, which generate more taxes. And this is all leading up to the question that I have. Is it perhaps that people in Albany do understand and they don't care so much to act on it, not because they don't think it's valid, but because their constituents don't think it's valid and don't understand. All they hear is, my rent is too damn high. That's all I keep on hearing. My rent is too damn high. But look at all the great things that development's doing. It's creating jobs in our community. It's making our community flourish. It's beautifying it. Is there a way to educate or has Revney talked about educating the people, the, the people who are you know, eligible for affordable housing to try to make them change their minds? Because if they start shouting at the legislature, I think that'll change their mind. Well, first of all, I'll answer your question. I think it's definitely the latter. It's about the const constituents and about short-term politics or near-term politics. I can't speak to Rebney's exact efforts, but from my understanding, Rebney are more focused on lobbying Albany than lobbying the constituents. I think it's first educating the, the electeds and hoping to make that way back to their constituents. But that's, I think, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, again, sitting at that city council hearing and that council member that here is the commissioner of city planning saying it won't be financially viable. And then in the same conversation, say, your AMIs are at 60%, 85% of my constituents are 30% AMI. So this offer doesn't speak to them. So I'll probably vote against it. Why? Because that specific council member can go back to their constituents and say, I voted against it because it wasn't good for you guys. Yeah. It didn't serve you guys. So I voted against it. But really, what did you do? You prevented more housing in New York City. By preventing more housing, you just applied more upwards pressure on rents because of supply demand dynamics. Rents grow in Manhattan, rents grow in Brooklyn and in Queens and in Jamaica and in every neighborhood because that's how the ring theory works at the end of the day. And if you can't build in Manhattan, you probably can't build in Queens and you probably can't build in Brooklyn. And you know, not extending the 421A deadline kabash thousands of apartments from coming in you know, in the inventory. Yeah, I haven't directly engaged with the legislator, but like I said, spent hours with Rebney and I asked the same questions. How can we be more helpful educating or being part of the dialogue with the decision makers for them to understand what's driving this bus? Well, one of the goals of this podcast is to serve as some level of education, right. assuming that the right people are, are listening. And whatever you could tell us about Innovation q and I think it's an exciting project and I would love for our listeners to hear about it. So we partnered with the Kaufman Astoria Studios and Bedrock Real Estate Partners, combined, assembled five urban blocks between 37th Avenue, sorry, th 37th Street, Northern Boulevard, 35th Avenue, and 36th Avenue, um, with Steinway running right smack in the middle. It took us almost two years to complete the assemblage. It's a significant um, site. Yeah. Yeah, it is a significant site. Um, and during, during the assemblage period, we had conversations, obviously, with city planning and city hall to understand what level of support would we have um, for the upzoning, taking it from uh, a one FAR zoned M to a 7.2 FAR. And that was uh, the basis for all of our conversations with the landowners as well, because it was partially optioned to help us carry the land through the rezoning where the developers take all the risk on undertaking for the rezoning, and it was all subject to approval. So from start to end, it took us over five years to go through the Euler process, which, you know, I think when we entered, we didn't realize um, it's going to take five years. It's go, yeah, we didn't realize it's going to take five years, and we, di we didn't realize it's going to wake up so many quote-unquote demons. But the way we looked at it in 2016, as I was starting to look in the outer boroughs, Larry said, you know, we're looking at all these sites, but don't just look for a standalone site to build a few hundred apartments. That's not our way. We want to do something impactful. We really want to enhance communities. We want to do something greater than just bringing a few apartments to the neighborhood. So when you look, Look at potential for scale. Look at potential for a, a long-term phased 
project, right? So 42nd Street in 1984, Larry buys 160,000 square foot full urban block, which is now home to over 5,000 people or 3,000 families or something like that. Same thing was sort of guiding us as we were looking in the outer boroughs. And we came across this idea, this pocket where I described, which is in the southern part of Astoria, northern part of Long Island City. So it's really an urban infill vision. It's all single story, chop shops, auto repairs. There was a pool joint. And we looked at that and we said, wow, this has great mass transit accessibility. It's very close to Northern Boulevard, which is a major artery leading into the bridge. Astoria as a neighborhood is just so undervalued. Um, it has this really cool fabric. It's diverse. You have all these different groups that sort of created this really cool community over the last 50 plus years. Great culinary scene, great academic institutions, good people. There's definitely a shortage of high quality housing. And with high quality housing, there's definitely a shortage here of good community infrastructure. We identified the lack of open space. We identified the lack of arts and culture. We identified the lack of community facilities. We identified the lack of new era type retail. And we thought that a large scale mixed use development can really enhance that pocket in Western Queens. And we started to put together a plan of how we bring all these components together. And eventually, with the help of ODA, my friend Aran Khan, who helped us shepherd through not only the process, but the vision, we got our approvals last November. November 22nd, yeah. yeah November 22nd. So it was a very interesting process. And you guys had a 46 to 1 vote in, in favor, which is, to me, <laughs> what, what the of. center was thinking. You know, early, very early on, we realized that in order for us to succeed in such a huge undertaking, especially in that part of the city, we really need to work very close with the community, with the NYCHA representatives, with different community-based organizations from all over the spectrum, from arts and culture and just youth groups and non-for-profits and the real local day-to-day -day community members. We had a few terrific team members that were involved in engaging that day-to-day -day for five years. Surrounding yourself with the right consultants and surrounding yourselves with the right advisory team and really understanding the dynamics between how this type of a project is perceived and advocated all the way up in Albany and City Hall and City Planning and HPD. And you have your local council member and the representatives and just a lot of politics. But at the same time, we had to be very persistent and tenacious when it came to our vision. And we had opposition. And it goes back to your question about how do you educate people that development isn't necessarily bad and trying to show them how, yes, with all these nice apartments, you'll also get over 100,000 square feet of park and public open spaces and a brand new movie theater and all these community facilities. And for those of you who are complaining about parking being so expensive, we're going to build all this parking and arts and culture facilities and maker studios and different spaces that will enhance community lives for all the different members. And at the same time, if you're complaining about your rent now, more inventory should stabilize or even reduce rent because it's simple supply and demand dynamics. So it was conversations on all different levels from doing these town halls engagements to, to local council member meetings and obviously all the way up to city planning and city hall in Albany. And like I said, it was a five-year challenge, which eventually I'm really happy to say that we'll be providing over 3,000 units with about 40% affordable housing. Great retail opportunity, over 150,000 square feet retail like 90,000 square feet of community facilities and all this public space. And it's just, it's the real 15 minute city vision that people are talking about all condensed in one five blocks of real urban mixed use development. Sounds like an amazing project. Yeah. I mean, we've seen some of the renderings and it's very impressive. Do you have any more questions for David? Mm -hmm. I think I tired him. Thank you coming in. And I'll tell you, I really appreciate your approach to development also. I enjoyed hearing about not only the experience that you have, but the approach to your experience and saying, I'm trying to do good for the city. Let me do good for yeah. the city because I love this city. But we we had so much fun talking to you, and you're such an interesting person, and you have so, you are really are are a mensch, yeah. and uh, we love having you here. Really appreciate yeah. it. Honored and humbled. Thank um, you so much. And for this is great fun. And yeah, I love listening to your podcast. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thanks, David. Bye. Well, everyone, that's our show. Thanks so much for listening. And of course, don't forget to subscribe. Also, don't forget to leave comments because we love to hear from our audience. Right, Brenda? Yeah. Feel free to reach out at info at sideandshine.com or visit our website at sideandshine.com. 
We really look forward to hearing from you. You can also reach out to David and Brenda at dshamshovich at sideandshine.com <laughs> and bslikowski at sideandshine.com. Those are lengthy last names. You can just find us on our website. That's right. <laughs>